Earlier in the broadcast, the head of Canada's spy agency said he's not overly concerned about a terrorist threat at the upcoming G8 and G20 summits. But his agency certainly sees much to worry about in its day-to-day -day operations. So what does keep the head of CSIS awake at night? Tonight, in a television first, Brian Stewart takes us inside CSIS headquarters for a closer look at the fears fueling Canada's spy agency. Night and day, intelligence reports from around the world pour into one of the most secretive buildings in the country. The headquarters in Ottawa of CSIS, Canada's security intelligence service. People who work here deal in spies, agents, and deep secrets. The faces of staff are hidden, where they constantly worry about keeping their jobs here unknown to the outside world. And he spend their whole careers in intelligence shadows. We have taken an oath to the Official Secrets Act. Um, I will, if someone asks me what I do, I work for the Government of Canada and then I try to change the subject. CSIS is our national institution created to worry for us, for the safety of Canadians at home and abroad. It worries that terror attacks that have struck at allies will strike here too. Perhaps when all is quiet, perhaps during the G8 and G20 summits, where CSIS is a key part of security preparations. We're the only country uh, on Al-Qaeda's hit list that has not yet been attacked. CSIS always worries whether nuclear plants, airports, bridges to the U.S. are targeted for attack. It worries that a new surge in foreign spying will rob Canada of its high technology and trade secrets. But always the key worry is what to worry about. Well, I worry about what I don't know. I mean, what our job is to acquire information. But what I really worry about is, is there a terrorist cell somewhere in Canada that we don't know about? Some Canadians, however, worry that CSIS worries far too much to the point of institutional paranoia. The service has been criticized for accepting dubious intelligence from brutal foreign regimes, criticized in court for giving flawed and contradictory evidence. And now on the eve of the international summits, it faces allegations of interference and threats aimed at activists. We have the same perspective on activists as our country does. Given its sometimes forbidding reputation, the never-before-televised CSIS headquarters turns out to be surprisingly light and airy. The architecture seeks to create an illusion that this most secretive service is wide open to the world. The CSIS director, Richard Fadden, is a longtime senior public servant who now likely handles more sensitive intelligence than anyone in Canadian history. For CSIS is now collecting more intelligence than ever, staggering amounts on counterterrorism. We spend something of the order of 40 to 45 percent of our budget on counterterrorism. That's a massive, massive effort. It's becoming more complicated as well because up until quite recently, uh, most of the terrorist threats truly originated abroad. You know, to be honest, a lot of them came out of the Afghanistan, Pakistan area. The real change over the course of the last couple of years has been the growth of domestic radicalization. And the really bad news is, is that the Brits, the Americans and the Australians are going through the same thing. So it's not a uniquely Canadian uh, phenomenon, it's one that we're sharing with our close allies. CSIS works extremely close with the U.S. CIA and FBI. Today, Fadden is anxious about certain people of interest traveling to and from the Horn of Africa. He goes to see Charles Bisson, Deputy Director of Operations, who's been discussing joint worries with American colleagues in Washington. Did you talk about Somalia at all? Yeah, we talked about Somalia. Obviously, they're worried because they got some of their own citizens that, that travel over there, just like some of our citizens that travel over there. So uh, we're trying to map out the training camps, exactly what they're doing, and uh, pretty worried because of the passport that they have, they could come back to North America. Mm -hmm. So we need to have like some great concern and some put some uh, some stuff at the airport so we can really identify when they're coming back. Mm -hmm. 
CSIS has active surveillance teams across Canada. 700 field agents watching an average of 200 persons of interest. We were allowed to follow one team practicing the shadowing of a terrorist rendezvous. Finally made it to the center median, continuing in a north direction towards the front doors of the YNR. It's harder than in films. Between 16 and 20 agents are needed 24-7 on just one suspect. Now, on the eve of the G8 and G20 meetings, many more agents are in the field. Roger, can we get someone out on the other side once it hits the intersection at the end of our site? Christina, using a false name and voice disguise, is a veteran agent. Obviously, with any international meetings being held on Canadian soil, we ramp up our coverage of our investigations of potential threats, and we certainly work closer uh, closer with other government departments and exchange a lot of information and able to uh, thwart any sort of threat. Agents are not police, make no arrests, rarely carry guns. Their currency lies in the constant receiving, compiling, sending and analyzing of reports on suspicious behavior from overseas and from communities here. We first have to have enough uh, information to meet a, th a threshold uh, to open up uh, an investigative level, whether it's on an individual or certain group. And then if it's deemed appropriate, it will be passed on to the appropriate government department who will deal with it. Canadians tend to think their national security is a thin line of defense. It is not. CSIS is the main provider of secret intelligence but is also part of a complex web of more than 15 government departments with intelligence functions, including the RCMP, Defense and Foreign Affairs Departments, and the Communication Security Establishment, or CSE, one of the world's most advanced electronic eavesdroppers. This is a formidable security establishment was able to flood an investigation with agents in 2006 when intelligence, including a CSIS informant, smashed the so-called Toronto 18 plot to bomb the heart of Toronto. The CSIS staff of 3,000 has surged more than 30 percent since 9-11, in part at least due to American demands that Canada upgrade its counter-terrorism security. I mean, we share a continent. We worry, honestly, about what is going on in their country, and uh, they worry about what's going on here. So, but it is a daily and a weekly uh, grind to make sure that we share the information, that we understand they understand what we're up to, and we understand what they're up to. Doesn't want to leave it in the hotel room. And so, in our cities, intelligence gathering has an urgent momentum. Agents develop sources, try to infiltrate suspected extremist groups and keep a steady watch on scores of individuals. All the standard stuff of TV drama. Less well known is the CSIS outreach program. It now visits mosques, temples, ethnic neighborhoods to build relationships and to network. One of the challenges that we do face are the perceived misconceptions about CSIS and our role. A lot of individuals come from countries where intelligence services aren't necessarily viewed favorably. Obviously here in Canada it's different, um, however we have to go out and educate people that we would like to talk to and tell them about our mandate and inform them that with their help they can ensure the safety of Canadians as well. CSIS directors are paid not to let political correctness shade their view. And when they meet in strategy sessions, they're clearly worried by the growing number of terror training centers abroad that various Canadian extremists now travel to. Now you got Afghanistan, Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. So there's there's a number of places where you could get uh, training and, and, and travel to. Well, be so, yeah. so no, I, I think it's on the increase. And that's, and that's one catalyst. Uh, one needs to look at the at the war in Sri Lanka and uh, and what came out of that and the impact that that has on a, on a completely different uh, mm -hmm. threat that mm -hmm. we're facing. Uh, South Asia, there's, uh, there's other issues as well in Indonesia, the Sahel in Africa, uh, the list goes on. And the issue of converts as well, which is, you've got to put in the mix. 
Yeah, so I guess what we've got to do, I think we need to pull some of this stuff together, try and define the problem for ourselves a bit better, and then see if other parts of the federal government agree. Well, as noted earlier, not everyone is pleased with this more expansive CSIS, nor delighted to find intelligence agents dropping around for a chat on their doorstep or at place of work. There is tension because part of the CSIS outreach is to approach activists and urge calm during the visits of foreign leaders. And this year, given the Olympics and the international summits, a growing number of people have been complaining such visits are really threats designed to limit protests. While police are the outward sign of security, CSIS works behind the scenes. The Aboriginal television network recently shot this surreptitious video which claims to show a CSIS agent warning an activist about protests of the G20. And different countries do not have the same perspective on activists as our country do. And there are other security forces that are from other countries that will not put up with a blockade in front of their president. CSIS would neither confirm or deny the woman was their agent, but the approach is consistent with CSIS intervention. CSIS likes to emphasize its politeness and courtesy, but still at the Canadian Civil Liberties Association headquarters, Nathalie de Rossier has files of complaints from Muslims and other minorities upset by CSIS attention. We don't want to turn into a society where people think that you know, government is gathering intelligence on you all the time and, and you know, uh, it can use it against you all the time. That's not what we want to do. That's not, we cannot combat terrorism by becoming uh, a lawless society. Is there a geographic focus to this yet or is it pretty well all, all across the country? It's For its part, CSIS worries that intelligence in Canada is changing in ways the country has not understood. Clarity is needed. Baden believes the nation needs to give it serious study. I mean, the last thing I want is for people to know about our trade craft, to know about how we acquire sources, and to know about our relationships and how we get uh, intelligence from abroad. But it seems to me that in a democracy, it makes a lot of sense that people should understand why we have these worries and what we're trying to do about them. But it's hard to do this when the only time we talk about security, not the only time, most of the time that we talk about security and intelligence is because something is going wrong. They got to make sure that you're an outgoing sort of person who can deal with people. Meanwhile, CSIS, a popular employee, is recruiting a new generation of agents to better reflect a diverse Canada. It seems certain in a nervous age to keep growing. Well, earlier in our program, the head of CSIS made some startling allegations. Allegations of foreign interference and of subtle but long-term attempts to influence Canadian politicians and policy. Those are among the challenges facing Canada's spy agency. Now, as we continue our exclusive look behind the scenes at CSIS headquarters, Brian Stewart examines how our surveillance agents stack up in the global spy game. World leaders attending G8 and G20 meetings practice the thousands of years old art of diplomacy. Their dirty secret, however, is that most eagerly undermine each other when possible with an even older art, espionage. Many are targeting this year's host nation, Canada, more than ever in history. In fact, in Canada today, the level of uh, espionage is roughly the same as it was during the Cold War. And in a couple of cases, it's worse than it was. And I've talked to my colleagues in uh, the UK, and they've noticed the same thing. Richard Fadden is director of CSIS. His files give him an alarming view of rising espionage threats here. And in fact, I'm beginning to worry that we may not be spending quite enough effort on counter espionage. The difficulty that I have, as does everybody, is you have to balance where you allocate resources. But it most definitely is a serious problem. And if I had to guess, I'd say it's going to get worse. In fact, Canada has run down its spy chasing capabilities since 9-11. Most of its 700 active field agents now chase terrorists, not spies. 
and that's what we're here for. And young candidate agents being briefed in Toronto are told the ways of counter-espionage are now a minor part of the work. During the Cold War, we had 75, 80 percent of our resources looking for spies in Canada, for Russian spies, Chinese spies, whatever they might be. And your job at that time as an intelligence officer was to find those spies, look at them, compromise them, identify their agents, identify their goals, their objectives. That was the old days. There's still some of those activities going on, but now our resources have shifted and we have 75 or 80 percent of our people looking at terrorism uh, for good reason. Foreign intelligence services, however, find our concentration on terrorism an opening. It leaves more chances to steal Canada's sensitive technology and trade secrets, all worth billions of dollars a year. We're targeted by between 20 and 25 foreign spy agencies, according to some studies such as the book Nest of Spies by a former chief of the CSIS Asia Pacific Desk. The point is, is that it's really enlightening when you start looking at that list because you realize that there's not only the so-called usual villains that are listed, like Russia, China, North Korea, blah, 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 but also the so-called friends are listed here. Not all analysts agree, but former agent Michel Juno Katsuya insists even French, British and American spy agencies now fight for any advantage. Sometimes to steal technology, sometimes to steal uh, intellectual property, sometimes it's to derail a contract and to prevent us to be capable to get access to a market or to get access to a contract. But how do we lose this money? We lose, we lose the money. It's not 10 or 10, 12 billion dollar of gadget disappearing. It's all in trade secret contracts, intellectual property, uh, opportunity, business opportunities that are lost due to the activities. Uh, 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 by foreign spy that comes to Canada. Espionage in Canada is hardly news. The defection of Soviet Embassy clerk Igor Gozenko in 1945 uncovered the first major Cold War Soviet spy ring in the West. In following decades, Canada regularly expelled whole batches of Soviet bloc diplomats found trying to steal Canadian secrets. Mr. Speaker, at noon today, on my instructions, the Under Secretary of State for External Affairs requested the Ambassador of the Soviet Union to withdraw 11 Soviet nationals from Canada. But the one constant throughout is that Canada, almost alone among senior nations, has no covert foreign intelligence service itself. British security has called us a freeloader as three quarters of our intelligence product is hand-me-down material from allies like Britain and the U.S. The espionage world Canada has not wanted to be part of operates in five core areas. Economic, sponsored by states, industrial, driven by corporations, and traditional military spy. But of growing concern are two increasingly active in Canada, foreign interference aimed at foreign ethnic communities and their human rights groups, and political espionage, foreign attempts to infiltrate Canadian political bodies. Canadians are largely unaware most of this is happening, so Richard Fadden, the head of CSIS, is on a campaign. He wants to awaken Canada, especially now, to the dangers of foreign interference here at home, something politicians are slow to address. Tonight, he's taken his warnings to a welcoming audience of police chiefs and security experts at the Royal Canadian Military Institute in Toronto. And I think if we don't start talking about it a little bit more than we have, we're going to regret it in the long term. His central message, Canadian society, not just its economy, is under attack. A byproduct of Canada's strong involvement in the world and its very cosmopolitan population is the growing presence of interference by foreign governments and other groups that wish to keep close watch on what their diaspora communities are doing in Canada. Fadden warns that foreign regimes bully members of ethnic communities to stay loyal to their former homeland and constantly seek advantage here. 
China is especially active through the use of university clubs. They're, they're funding Confucius Institutes in most of the campuses across Canada. They fund them. Uh, they're sort of managed by people who are operating out of the embassy or consulates. Nobody knows that the Chinese authorities are involved. They organize demonstrations against the, they have de organized demonstrations against the Canadian government uh, in respect to some of our policies concerning China. They've uh, organized demonstrations to deal with what are called the five poisons, Taiwan, Falun Gong, and others. Among the most sensitive files at CSIS, however, concern foreign interference in Canadian politics. A half dozen countries are thought to be trying to turn some of our politicians into agents of influence, with success at municipal levels in British Columbia, and even in two provinces at the cabinet level. A number of countries take the view that if they can develop influence with people relatively early in their careers, they'll follow them through before you know it. A country is providing them with money. There's some sort of covert guidance. Uh, we're, in fact, a bit worried in a couple of uh, provinces that we have an indication that there's some uh, political, uh, political figures who have developed quite an attachment to foreign countries. The individual becomes uh, in a position to make decisions that, is, that affect the country or the province or a municipality. All of a sudden, decisions aren't taken on the basis of the public good, but on the basis of another country's preoccupations. So we do worry about that. How much the Harper government has been warned is unclear. CSIS is thought to be still preparing a major report on such subversion. But so many espionage attacks on Canada taken together revives debate in intelligence circles over our lack of awareness abroad. Some insist it finally proves we must build that covert foreign intelligence service we don't have. CSIS has 50 agents abroad, including two dozen in Afghanistan helping the military, but it's restricted from true offensive spying. Canada's Foreign Affairs Department similarly keeps away from secret espionage. There's some historical evidence that lack of our own espionage resources in critical areas has left Canada blundering about half aware, as when it lobbied to take on the Kandahar mission in Afghanistan, unaware the Taliban were aiming to come back. Canada seems short of eyes and ears in murky areas. I mean, I'm not a advocating a whole lot of illegal activity in the countries. I'm just saying we should get with the game as it's played in the 21st century. Some of the most respected intelligence experts like Ron Atke believe our refusal to spy marks Canada as an international lightweight. The risk is sovereignty. We're getting information uh, that may be accurate but may be nuanced, not necessarily in our favor. Um, we have to be suspicious of getting information I guess from any, our, our, our best friends are the Americans, of course, the greatest provider of intelligence to, to the Canadians. Do they give us information that is, 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 is crystal clear and directly in our interest or in their interest? Some feel CSIS should grow to take on foreign intelligence as well, but its director, Fadden, is cautious and sees pitfalls. If the government decides it wants to do it, it can be done. It would take, I think, some number of years before an agency like that could be up and running. Um, could absolutely be done. We could absolutely find countries against whom we would want to spy. All I'm arguing is it's the sort of decision, well, you imply, we've been thinking about it for 20 years. It's the sort of thing you have to think hard about before you create the agency. Meanwhile, Canada will again be smiling when foreign leaders come calling. The subject of their espionage attacks on this host nation are not likely to be discussed here.